Last week, you know, I talked about Jesus' admonition that all of us who are his disciples have to be careful what we say. The skull, I just want to rehearse that, remind you here in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37. Matthew, if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37, I'm going to read this one in the New Living Translation. And Jesus was saying this, he said, the words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. And the nature of the Greek in here is talking about like if you were in a legal trial, you're there before the judgment seat of God Almighty, and your, your words are going to be, it's like playing, okay, play the tape of this one, you know, and he plays the tape of that one, and you say, oh, really, I said that? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> or, boy, whew, I'm glad I said that. He says, you know, you'll be acquitted. In other words, you will be judged free and not subject to a punishment. Or, of course, if you're condemned, that means you're guilty of missing the mark. And let's go to Matthew in Matthew 12. Let's stay in Matthew 12. This goes down to uh, verse uh, 36 here. And I want to cite this one, the whole thing, in these two verses here in uh, the expanded Bible version. And I tell you that on the judgment day, people will be responsible that giving an accounting or an answer is the way the expanded puts it for every careless, that is idle or thoughtless or unhelpful thing, unhelpful word they have said, verse 37, and the words that you have said will be used to judge you. Some of your words will prove you right. They're going to justify you for many charges but some of your words will prove you guilty. So we're going to be responsible for those unhelpful things we might have said. And I am sure I'm not the only person who has said unhelpful things or things that was a careless word that I might have said that have hurt somebody else or that I didn't answer a question carefully. And it's, it's important for us to realize <laughs> this is the point. In an age that we live in now, where people so oftentimes throw out all these words and they say these things, and I, you know, what you hear on the media sometimes is shocking from this standpoint. This is the world we live in. But as Christians, that's not the standard we're to live up to. We're not supposed to be sitting here copying and emulating the world. We're supposed to set a different example. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ. So when people will ask you, you run into somebody, maybe you know them, an acquaintance or something like this, or somebody at work or uh, whatever it might be, an old high school friend or an old childhood sweetheart, whatever it might be, when people ask you a question, are you prepared to give an answer? And that is, give me a, are you prepared to give an answer that you'll be happy to have recounted you on the judgment day? What should be your attitude and approach when you give an answer? Well, let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Apostle Peter says this, and he was speaking to all the, the, the churches in this general letter that he wrote. He said, but in your hearts, he says, set Christ apart as Lord. That is, as holy. In the way the, the Amplified puts it, acknowledging him, it explains, giving him first place in your lives. Christ, you know, people will commonly say, oh, I believe Jesus is my Lord, Jesus is Lord. What does this mean? It means, it says, the Amplified says, it's acknowledge his holiness and sovereignty in your life. That's fancy words. <laughs> That's fancy words to say that what he says are your marching orders. What Jesus says is how you should live. He sets the standards of how you are to behave. There are a lot of people who find that very hard. But Peter says, but in your hearts set Christ apart as Lord. And you know, the interesting thing is, because I looked this up in the original Greek, this, this phrase. You know, in English, but in your hearts set Christ apart as your Lord. You know, 
it comes to sort of at the end of the phrase. But in the inspired Greeks, it's, it, it is the, the emphasis is as Lord, put him in your heart. You know, in other words, the emphasis is first and foremost that Jesus is Lord. He is the Lord. As Lord, he should be the first in your life and in your mind and your thoughts and what you're doing. It's a form of emphasis. Now, it's interesting. This wasn't just a thought here. I mean, this is actually um, that Peter came up with. No, he's, 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 he's coming up with something that he's rehearsing that was in the prophet Isaiah because this is, a, this is a very old and a very important concept of putting Christ as Lord in our lives and the first thing in our minds that he is our Lord, that he has sovereignty in our lives. If we go to Isaiah in the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 8, and uh, let's, start, let's go in here, verse 13. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read in the, the Amplified Version here. It is the Lord of hosts whom you are to regard as holy and awesome. He shall be your source of fear, they add. He shall be your source of dread. Not man, the way the Amplified puts it. Okay, it's saying God is to be, you know, this source of fear, your source of dread, not man. You're not to be scared of men. You're not to be scared of their opinions. You're not to be scared of the labels they're going to apply or the things they're going to say. No, your, your, your thought is what, what God is going to think of you because as Jesus said, the words you say will either acquit you or condemn you you have this presence in your mind that you're in God's presence when you speak with others. In verse 14 here in Isaiah 8, then, okay, if the Lord of the hosts, if you're regarding him as holy and awesome, if you're regarding him as the one to whom you're accountable, then he shall be a sanctuary. Okay, a sanctuary. He's going to be a sanctuary to you. That is, a, uh, that is a sacred, indestructible shelter for those who fear and trust him, is the way, I, uh, the, way the Amplified elaborates what the meaning of what Isaiah was trying to get at. But he says, okay, so if you put the Lord, okay, of hosts, whom you, you know, if you make him holy and awesome in your life, and he is the source, he is the source of your fear, you're not going to fear of men, because he is, shall be the sanctuary of your life, that indestructible shelter in all seasons and storms, the things that come through. But he says this here, Isaiah, but to both the houses of Israel, and I, I, I thought it was great that the Amplified understood and because it makes the point both the northern and southern kingdoms, Israel and Judah, because if Israel had, was divided at that time when Isaiah was writing, you had the northern ten tribes and the southern ten tribes, and the southern, uh, southern two, uh, three tribes. The southern three tribes were known as Jews and the northern ten tribes were known as Israelites. And they were carried away and went different places and there's a whole prophetic story of what these things happened to these people. But it's a very interesting story. But he's saying that both to the Israelites and to the Jews, this Jesus, this Lord of hosts, he will be a stone on which to stumble and a rock on which to trip. A trap and a snare for the inheritance of Jerusalem, Jerusalem being the capital city of the kingdom of Judah. Now, who is the Lord of hosts? Who is, is the Lord, the Kyrios, who's, you know, that we are you to put him as G, the Christ. You're supposed to put Christ as Kyrios. What, what is, who is this? Well, Peter was drawing a very clear parallel. And it, it would took, you know, from this standpoint, writing about 20 to 25, maybe 30 years after Peter died, it was Apostle John when in his gospel who made the point clear, something that most Christians still don't understand. Most Christians don't understand what I'm going to tell you right now. 
But here it is, John 8:58, and if you've been listening to me and in, in this broadcast for any, any length of time, you'll know it. it John 8:58 in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, Jesus said to them, "Assuredly, before Abraham was, I am." And as the editors of the translators of that Bible note, that I am is the name God gave himself at the burning bush, bush in Exodus chapter 3 and verses 13 to 14. Very clear. A reference to divinity. Jesus was saying he was the I am before Abraham was I am. If you go here in John 8 and let's go to verse 24. Therefore, I told you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am, and the Greek word here is emimi, it's Strong's 15.10, Strong's 15.10, emimi, you know, many translators, I don't know what kind of version that you have that you're, you're reading along with as I, as I give this message, but most translations will will insert after the word for if you do not believe that I am he but you know the word he, he is not in the in original inspired text that is an insertion by the translators because they're obfuscating the point Jesus was saying I am if you do not believe that I am you will die in your sins Jesus was saying that to the Pharisees and believe me that was stuck in their throats <laughs> in a major way. The, you know, the, the translators of both the Holman Christian Standard Bible and the Expanded Bible Version all know that Jesus was claiming to be the Lord of hosts. That was his point. It's not just Jeff Patton's personal, private, you know, interpretation of the Scriptures, no. It's there, but yet most people don't get that. So who, when, when, when Peter says as Lord in your, you know, in your hearts, as Jesus is Lord in your hearts, okay, and set Christ apart, acknowledging him as Lord in your life. For what purpose? Let's go to, back to 1 Peter 3, 15. I'm going to read it now in the Amplified Bible Version. But in your heart, set Christ apart as Lord. Always be ready to give a logical defense. And the Greek word here is strong 627. It's apologia. Apologia. From which we get the modern word apology. But an ancient apologia was a verbal defense or answer, a well reasoned reply, a thought out response to adequately address the issue or issues that are, that are being raised. An apology in classical Greek times, when, this, when Peter was writing, had nothing to do with somehow saying, I'm sorry. That was nothing to do with it. But in your hearts at Christ apart as Lord, and always be ready to give a defense, an apologia. But rather, this apologia, this defense or answer was a reasoned argument that presented evidence or supplied compelling proof or, uh, or logic for what you are just saying. Always be ready to give an apologia, a reasoned, a logical defense or argument to anyone who asks you to account for the hope and confident assurance that is within you. And then it adds, yet do it. Give your apologia, give your defense, give your argument to this person who's asking for your hope of, you know, the faith of Christianity, of believing in a God you can't see and in a creator where this world denies it. And he says, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Okay, now I'm citing the Amplified Bible version. I want to look at these words a little, a little more deeply here and, and look at it. When Peter was saying, give your answer, okay, when you're doing this, to anyone who asks you, he's saying, for, to account for our belief
Okay. To anyone who, when, when, when Jesus is asking us, Okay, and he's tell, he tells us by our words we're going to be uh, justified or we're going to be contemned. And Peter is saying that it is, you know, because Christ is our Lord, we have to always be ready to give a defense for the gospel, for the hope that is within us. And we have to do it with gentleness and respect. Now, the word in the Greek text for gentleness is Strong's 4240. It's protes can be translated meekness or and that's maybe not a good word to use here in the 21st century 21st century it means better gentle strength it's a strength which expresses power with reserve and gentleness so you give your apologia you give your defense your reasoned argument with a power that is has reserve and gentleness it's just not blam. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna blow him away. No, that's not how he's saying it. You're you're to do it with gentleness. This this protes, such gentle force. The lexicon says begins with the Lord's inspiration and finishes by His direction and empowerment. It is a divinely balanced virtue that can only operate through faith. At least this sort of spiritual gentleness, giving our answer with this sort of gentleness, this sort of gentle strength. It's, it's a power that has, but yet has, is, there's, it's given with reserve, it's given with gentleness. It's something that can only come through faith. This is, this is what the lexicon notes. Now, where it says, of course, is in Peter is saying, that we're to give this account for the hope and the confident assurance that is within you, doing it with gentleness and respect is the word amplified Bible version uses. But actually, it's Strong's 5401. It's a much more interesting word. And probably anybody who's in astronomy knows it's, it's Phobos. <laughs> Fear. You know, one of the moons, I believe it's one of the moons of Mars, isn't it? Phobos. <laughs> I think that, you, you know, some of these things, Phobos is commonly used in the scripture, sometimes positively, in relationship to man's attitude towards God, where you have this respect translation of Phobos in the Amplified Bible version. In the Coulter translation, they use reverence. But strictly speaking, a phobia or a Phobos is a fear. Most often in the in the scriptures, it means it's Phobos is used negatively. It's it's a habit of withdrawing from the Lord, and withdrawing from His will. Phobos, you know, the the roots of this is it has a sense of withdraw, to remove oneself, hence to avoid because of dread or right. So when we're to give our answer. With protes a phobos, that gives you something to think about. Is with this gentle strength, but at the same point, yes, there's respect of God, and perhaps you know there is also an intention, even because it, it, the color is in there. Well, maybe you know, you know, we maybe the kind of answer we're giving, we need to be pulling back a little bit from the person we're doing this with because we have to give it with reserve remember it's you're giving it with reserve and gentleness you're giving it measured so you pull yourself maybe back a little bit from the situation you do it because you are in in your mind you realize okay I'm doing this I'm before God I'm on record as Jesus said by my words I'm gonna be justified or by my words I will be condemned okay I know I'm the one on record more so you know that any of the American, the 14 American spy agencies, you know, who are constantly listening to everybody's communications, God hears everything. And what goes on within us, as well as what we say and what goes on in the outside. So, let's go back to 1 Peter 3, 15. I'll read this time in the New Living Translation. It says, instead you must worship Christ as Lord of your life, Okay, he is, he is the Kyrios, he is the Lord. And if anyone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready, always be ready to explain it. 
However, is this a, is, is this is this a blanket command? Okay, somebody says something to you, do you have to go jump in and get involved? I mean, in this day of social media, where we have Facebook and we have conversations and we have threads and we have all this and we get in, and you know that you you know what you know what the con you know the 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 back and forth of conversations and postings can go like on the internet, don't you? Of course you do. <laughs> I mean, you can just listen to a little bit of what goes back and forth by the president of the United States and some of the people out there, and you know they 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 dig engage in this sort of thing. The scriptures make it clear there's a major exception to this general rule about being ready and willing to give to anyone who asks you for a logical defense of, of the gospel. That doesn't mean that just because something comes to you and there you can say, okay, I know he's a Christian, so I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to stick him with this and I'm going to make him, he, he, he's under the obligation, he's got to, he's got to, He's got to engage with me, and I'm I'm ready for him, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do this sort of thing verbally. Now let's take a look at something. We must know that you know it's we're not under a total obligation under all circumstances to give someone an answer. In Second Timothy chapter two and verse twenty-three, turn with me to Second Timothy chapter two and verse twenty-three. And it's very interesting because Paul gives this at the very close. This is the last epistle, the last letter that Paul wrote before he was executed. And it's interesting because he, you know, the Apostle Paul, and we'll, we'll get into it a little bit, he, he engaged in giving apologia. That's most of what his ministry was about. You read the accounts in the book of Acts and you pick it up from his epistles. He was constantly dialoguing and getting back and forth with those who were opposing him as well as just those who were asking him questions. Paul was prepared for that, though. He had had the training for it, both not only in growing up in the Greek culture, but also the training that he had in the pharisaical school of how they reasoned and argued and all this sort of stuff. He grew up with that. A little bit different background from most of us today, by the way. Most of us don't, you know, in school we don't get that sort of training the way that they used to. But Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 23, expanded Bible version. He says this, Stay away from or as the expanded Bible version says, avoid, have nothing to do with, what? Foolish and stupid or ignorant arguments, controversies, speculations, because you know they grow into or they breed or they beget quarrels. Stay away from foolish and stupid arguments because you know they grow into quarrels. It sounds like a lot of what the flaming that goes on on the internet right now. And a servant, that is a slave, a bond servant, a servant of the Lord, the Kyrios, and we are, for Christians, we're servants of the Lord. We are bought and paid for. We are. You know, we've been bought with the price of Christ's blood. So you and I, we're bought or his. And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be what? Kind to everyone. A good teacher, that is, a teacher that's qualified, a teacher that's able, and patient. A good teacher and patient. Teaching anyone. Uh, this world, world of antiquity, does it, requires an enormous amount of patience and takes quite a bit of thought. How am I going to get a teachable moment and a concept across? Not everyone is the brightest bulb in the room, you know. Or some people, there is their prejudices and whatever they, you know, you can say it and they're not hearing it. Whatever it might be, stay away from foolish and stupid arguments because you know they grow into quarrels and a servant. The Lord must not quarrel but must be kind to everyone, a good teacher and patient. Verse 25, the Lord's servant must gently teach those who disagree. 
That is, gently instruct, gently correct those who are opponents. This is the extra way the expanded Bible version puts it. Those who disagree, those who I mean, can even have far more than just disagree, who are opponents, then perhaps, maybe, <laughs> God will let them change their minds. That means grant them repentance, you know, to use, this, use the church speak, the, the religious language, which most people don't understand. So God will let them change their minds, maybe, so they can accept the truth. Grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth is the way more, much, I think the King James goes, something like that. So stay away from foolish and stupid arguments because you know they grow into quarrels. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be kind to everyone. A good teacher and patient, the Lord's service must gently teach those who disagree. Then maybe God will let them change their minds so they can accept the truth. So how we deliver our apologia, our defense, our answers. It's very important because what is the end result? As Christians, you know, it's, it's sort of like, okay, it's, what are the basics? Okay, what are the prime directives, if you want to put it this way? Yes, we're to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. You know, we love God with all our heart, so we know that we're commissioned. We, we are going to be accountable for all of our words. They'll either justify us or condemn us. And we have to be ready and able and willing to give a response to those who ask us about the faith with us, although we don't want to get in quarrels, foolish and, you know, ignorant arguments. But we have to be do this because if we if we give our answers well in the situation perhaps you know god will be able to get through to them to have them to have it soak you know oftentimes when you teach someone it takes soak time they're initially you know reluctant to do it Sometimes you have to stir them up. You might even have to get them angry a little bit. I mean, you're not like you're trying to get them angry, but then you, if, when you've got them angry, at least you've got them engaged. So... Okay, so when people... <coughs> When people ask a question, which is neither a foolish or stupid argument that's going to just lead to useless quarrels, are you prepared to answer it? 2 Timothy 2.15, 2 Timothy 2.15, Home and Christian's Bible, Standard Bible. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly dividing the word of truth. Correctly dividing the word of truth. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I in looking over some different thoughts about this particular verse, you know, I liked um, Ellicott's commentary had something interesting to say. It said, Timothy, and those in the position of Timothy, okay, Anyone who is being, you know, is a disciple of, of Christ, engaged in the gospel, they were to show themselves approved unto God by turning others over whom they possessed influence. And generally the people we can have the most effect upon are those we have some sort of influence in their lives. We're engaged in, with them and they... They see enough and they know us that they have, we have some sort of influence with them. Parents obviously have a lot of influence with their children. Children can have influence with their parents. It goes both ways. Uh, a person can have influence with their friends or coworkers. These are the sorts of people we can have influence. We know that. Generally, they're not the friends on Facebook so much, <laughs> although sometimes, yes. depends upon the, what, you, what, what kind of ground or mutual points of view you share and the relationship you've built. 
So by, by generally, Timothy and those in positions of Timothy, you know, the turning to others over whom they have some sort of influence, some sort of relationship from the pursuit of vain and unprofitable things. That's what we're to do, is to be light. And Ellicott puts it, then, then their work, uh, work would be the work of workmen tested by trial and would be found to have withstood the test. Now, whenever we obviously engage with those with whom we are have a, some sort of relationship, that we have some sort of influence, and it usually goes both ways. And sometimes if it's a major thing, whatever, it can be something of a trial. <laughs> it can. But if we're doing it in a gentle way, knowing that we have, you know, having you know, with with this gentle power at the same time, we're conf we're conscious of the fact, yeah, we've got to remember to respect God and do it the way He wants it done. It can be something of a trial. It can be somewhat difficult because we, how am I going to answer this? How am I going to do this? When we give our answers to those questions. You know, it, you know we, we do it because we understand we're behaving or acting or conducting ourselves as ambassadors of Christ. Ambassadors of Christ. His representative. Because that's what we are if we're a Christian. We're his representatives here on earth to the rest of humanity. Especially, and primarily, of course, to those with whom we have some sort of influence. To whom we can give well-reasoned responses that are doctrinally sound, and that we deliver. We deliver these messages. We do our teaching. We do our dialogue. We give our apologia, our, you know, our defenses, in a way that is spoken with gentle power, Power, yes, but it's gentle and sometimes, sometimes with reserve. It expresses the spirit of kindness, but also patience. These are not things that are naturally human, are they? We get these things, obviously, from the Spirit of God. And to give an answer, as anyone who's teaching or anyone who speaks knows, you, have to, you need to know your audience, don't you? You really do need to know your audience. You need to know their point of view, their attitudes, their motivation, even their prejudices, and craft your response accordingly. When you read the disciples, and you read in, in both in Acts, and you read uh, the accounts in, in Paul's epistles of his, and in Acts, his dialoguing, his, his preaching the gospel, his giving his apologia, to, to different people. He does it from the standpoint that they knew who they were speaking with. They had, you see that and they crafted it very carefully. Sometimes they did it because they wanted to save their skin. <laughs> you know, Paul, when he, was, when he was about to be killed in the temple at Jerusalem, because he went up with these fellows who were, who were at the end of a, a Nazarite vow, and he was there and he got grabbed by a bunch of his adversaries from Asia Minor who saw him there in the temple and said, Ah, there he is, let's get him! And they made these accusations of him when he was hauled up. But when the Romans put, said, Okay, we want to know what it's about, he made the point that he, 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 he talked about the resurrection of the dead, which he knew that half the people sitting in that audience who were Pharisees believed in a resurrection while the fat Sadducees didn't. And that got him off the hook that day. He wasn't killed. So maybe he gave, his, he gave a reasoned answer with, yes, with gentle logic, but he also with fear because he didn't want to have it. He didn't want to be killed immediately <laughs> from that standpoint. Know your audience. If you know who you're speaking with, then you can craft your response accordingly. Let's go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. I'm going to read this one in the expanded Bible versions. Colossians 4, 6. Paul said here, When you talk, you should always be kind or gracious is the way the expanded would add and pleasant 
be kind and pleasant pleasant or winsome pleasant engaging interesting or wholesome literally it the, the may um, maybe the king james would put it seasoned with salt when you talk you should always be kind and pleasant or that you should be it should be seasoned with salt so you will be able to answer everyone in the way you should in the way of course uh the expanded puts it in those different terms is because we don't say you know answer somebody you know it's the your your answer is seasoned with salt that would we'd puzzle over that for a while you know when you eat things obviously you do like to season it with salt because you like to have it with flavor that's sort of like the idea but when you're talking it's you're seasoning it with salt by you know it's you're being gracious and you're being pleasant it's be it makes it more attractive to listen to, to hear it's more engaging that's something we need to work on of course this this statement that paul made you know he obviously picked it right off the gospel let's go to mark chapter 9 and verse 50. paul paul would have had mark by the way he would have had the gospel of mark uh, mark chapter 9 and verse 50 new living translation salt is good for seasoning but if you, it loses its flavor how do you make it salty again <laughs> you must have the qualities of salt among yourselves and live at peace with each other in other words, you know, be engaging, be interesting, be tasty. Make it something that's pleasant to, to deal with and not, to, you're not just, you know, when people see you coming, they want to run the other way. <laughs> Let's go to Ephesians 4 and verse 29. This is speaking, you know, when we when are giving our responses, as though it's seasoned with salt, what are we to not do? Paul also expresses that. Because in the ancient, uh, the Greco-Roman world, they knew the other way you could talk. You could talk where we're seasoned with sulfur. Let's go to Ephesians 4 and verse 29, the Amplified Bible version. And translating Paul's words is here, it says, Do not let unwholesome, that is foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth. Now, we all know what those unwholesome, worthless, vulgar, profane, <laughs> you, we, we probably have a list. We could probably immediately scribble down. But he says, but Paul, but only such speech as is good for building up others. Edifying is the, is the way you'll see it in many of the older translations. Edifying, to build up, you know, an edifice is built up. But only such speech as is good for building up according to the need and the occasion. So we speak, we know our audience. What is the need? If you're asked to speak to a group, to address a group, what is the need? What is going on? And what is the occasion? Now, this is July 1st. Canada Day, oh Canada, our home and native land. Uh, or, you know, in the fourth is American Independence Day, isn't it? Oh, say can you see by the stars early light. You know, we have, I could have spoken about our governments, but I think if you want to know something about government, maybe the message is to go back into the book of Samuel, see where the prophet Samuel talks to the people when they ask him for a king and tells them what the price is going to be and they're not going to like it. <laughs> you, we can see that, okay, from that standpoint. So if I was going to address a bunch of American patriots, I might, might have some different things to say. I'd try to season my speech with salt that is appropriate for the occasion to get their interest and to make a point. What I think, what is the need? What is the occasion? Do not let unwholesome words come out of your mouth, but only such speech as is good for building up others according to the need and the occasion, so that it will be a blessing to those who hear you speak. That's oftentimes, you know, is it a blessing to those who hear a speaker or is it a curse? <laughs> oh, no! Ah! You know, you know, it's fingernails on the chalkboard. 
you, uh, you know, I've heard, you know, you, I'm sure we've all heard people who you hear them speak and it's like, it's not a blessing to you listen to this person speak. <laughs> Man, you know, you know, it's like he, uh, during some of the last elections, you know, somebody comes on, he say, turn it off right now. This, this fellow just, you know, he rubs the fur the wrong way. <laughs> it really is not a blessing. It's a curse to listen to this person. Do not let unwholesome words come out of your mouth. And that's in this 21st century where there's so much corrupt language. We've got to be careful about that. It's easy to fall into it. Every single one of us is easy to, to adopt it because it's all around us all the time. All the, all the words we shouldn't, but only such speech is good for building up others according to the need and occasion so that it may be a blessing to those who hear you. So let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that we may know how we ought to answer. That takes reflection. And I suppose, you know, that means we, we cannot be you know, the fastest gun in the West with our response. We've got to pull, we've got to pull out our response, you know, relatively slowly. We can't be fast on the draw. That may not make us always, you know, oh, he's the most witty person and what all these other things, but you know, when we speak, we have to have the consciousness that we have to do it with this gentle power as well as the phobos, the fear, you know, is because, you know, God is hearing us. And by our words, we're going to be justified. And by our words, we might be condemned. So we have to think about this. We also need to realize, you know, and always have this consciousness in our mind who we are and the effect that we can have on others. Who we are and the effect we can have on others. Great scripture for that. Same words can be taken two different ways by people with two different mindsets. What we say to some could be very encouraging and others it can be them as fighting words. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15. This is a good one to see. Good one to realize because it especially applies to in our time right now in the 21st century. 2 Corinthians 2 and chapter 15, I'm going to read this in the Amplified Bible Version. Paul saying, and he's writing to the Corinthians, a bunch of people who had more than a share of problems and who lived in a very dynamic heathen society. <laughs> For we are the sweet fragrance of Christ which ascends, the way the Amplified puts it, to God. A sweet fragrance of Christ to God. It's like the idea of offering an incense offering, okay, which they all would have been, the pagan world did it as well as in the, the Hebrew world. In the sacrifices that were offered, they had incense offerings in the temple too. For we are a sweet fragrance of Christ to God. It says, discernible both among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So it's discernible. We, Christians, those who are the servants, the bought and paid for bond servants of Christ, and when we speak, we are discernible as a fragrance of Christ, you know, as an incense offering, not only to those who are being saved, but to those who are perishing. To the latter, that is to those who are perishing, one an aroma from death to death. The Amplified puts it a fatal, offensive odor. But to the other, an aroma from life to life. A vital fragrance, living and fresh. You see, just to walk in in some, some places, if I was in, to walk into the midst of an audience and they're all LGBTQ, SRIV, you know, WXYZ, whatever, and to speak, would I be 
an offensive fatal odor or a vital fragrance? So it says here, for we are this sweet fragrance of Christ. And then Paul asks this question, and who is adequate and sufficiently qualified for these things? See, God gives us his Holy Spirit. He's, he is with the power, is, you know, we are, we, we, are, we are Christians by grace because God granted us repentance that we are, he opened our minds so that we could turn from the, the, the deceptive teachings of this world. It says this, 2 Corinthians 2, 17, for we are not Okay, we're back. So we must realize who we are and the effect we have on others. As I'm saying here in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 to 17, for we are a sweet fragrance of Christ to God, discernible among those both who are being saved and among those who are perishing. And Paul asked a question, okay, preachers out there Paul was saying there were all these religious people of, of his time peddling God's word shortchanging and adulterating God's message is the way the Amplified puts it which is them's fighting words because there are a lot of people who are shortchanging and adulterating God's message they are blaspheming, as I mentioned last week, because they're blaspheming because they're turning, they're trying to change what is good and what is righteous, and then trying to substitute what is evil and what is wicked. This is going on among those who are like who are like many who are peddling God's word these days. You have all sorts that you can hear for that. For we are not like many peddling God's word, but from pure, uncompromised motives as the Amplified says commissioned and sent out from God we speak his message in Christ in the sight of God so we're speaking he's he's making this point we have to realize who we are we're commissioned and sent out from God to speak his message in Christ in the sight of God and of course because we're on record you know the NSA, you know, I'm on record right now. But you know, the NSA is on record by God. <laughs> We're all on record. Everything we speak, and when we speak, we have to have this consciousness that we're speaking, and we do it with gentleness and, and with fear, respect, awe of the one who we have to give an account to. Paul, as I said, he, he was a, he, during his whole ministry, he had to deal with lots of people who were his opponents. And he had to speak with gentleness, patience. He was also, because the gentleness is not meekness from the standpoint, it's gentle power. And in confronting some of these people who were like merchants peddling God's word, shortchanging and adulterating God's uh, message, he, he came out here in what he was saying here in this letter, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 1. We'll, we'll go there, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 1. And in some ways, this is his response, okay? He is answering for the hope that is within him because he has been commissioned to speak. And so he's giving, he's talking to his people he has influence with, and he's saying, are we starting to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some false teachers, letters of recommendation from you or uh, to you? No. You are our letter of recommendation, 
written in our hearts, recognized and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Because he had taught them, he'd given them their answers, and they became a proof of this ministry. If Go back. Okay, so Paul, who was you know, a great part of his ministry, a great part of his ministry is dialoguing and having to give his apologia, to having to give his reasoned defense for what he taught and how he taught and some of these things to the different people. He was saying to the Corinthian brethren, and really, 2 Corinthians, in many ways, is an apologia. It, it, it is an apology. But he was saying, are we starting to commend ourselves? Or do we need, like some false teachers, letters of recommendation to you or for, or for you? No. You are the letter of recommendation written in our hearts, recognized and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. His answers, he's, he's using, it's a metaphor. His answers and his teaching was like a letter from Christ. And in this way, our answers to people, it should be like, you know, we're standing and it's, it's like a letter from Christ. It's, it's, it's the words that Christ would speak through us. Delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of the human hearts, such as the confidence and steadfast reliance and absolute trust that we have through Christ towards God, not that we are sufficiently qualified in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency and qualifications come from God. So it is that starting point when we speak. We have to realize, okay, I'm going into this, I'm doing this. I know I'm nothing, you know, whatever, but I have this opportunity I, I, with these people I have influence with. And so, you know, the qualifications, the sufficiency is going to come from God. As Christians, we have to approach that and realize that so that our answers are seasoned with salt. Sometimes we don't even know, you know, what's going on, obviously, with our audience. So oh, you have a whole group of people. What you say, is it going to affect people different ways? Sure, it will. We're a fragrance of God to those who are being saved and those who are perishing. I know when I've spoken before church audiences and I've had, an, and I've had a church hall filled with all sorts of people, different people respond different ways. They hear different things. And it touches them different ways. He concludes this whole thing in 2 Corinthians 5 and 12. says, we're not trying to prove ourselves to you again, but we're giving you a reason to be proud of, to boast about us. So he, he was writing this, this, this whole thing. He said, look, you can, you can be you're proud of us. Then you will have an answer to those who are proud about things that can be seen, the outward appearance rather than what is in the heart. And that's an important point. There are a lot of people who look at external things, but they don't see what is the value or the spiritual intent or the meaning or the worth. Now let's close this with uh, this scripture. As I said, when we're going to give a message that's on topic, and we're going to craft something that is for the audience, in doing this, we have to understand there is something here that's important, that we understand who we are and what we're about. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 in the Amplified Bible Version. <clears throat> you believers are like living stones, being built up into a spiritual house for a holy and dedicated priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. See, we're being built up for a, is, is as a priesthood. Our job, is a, the job of a priesthood is to teach people, is to give people answers, to show people what is right from what is wrong.
and to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in the scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a chosen stone, a precious, honored cornerstone, and he who believes in him, who adheres to, that's what it means, to trust in, to rely on him, that's what it means to believe in Christ, will never be disappointed in his expectations because we have this faith. Because we have the faith, we can speak. And we can have the speak, and we can have confidence, we can speak with gentleness. And we do it in, in reverence or fear. Respect for the one for who we're speaking. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the very stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For those who disbelieve. See, Jesus, when we talk, <coughs> and we talk about, we talk anything about Jesus, for some it is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and they stumble because they disobey the word of God. And to this, they were also appointed him. They were also appointed. But you, he's saying to the brethren, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a special people for God's own possession. For what purpose? So you may proclaim the excellencies, the wondrous deeds and virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we are to give an answer to those who still are in the dark. Okay. Continue. Once you were not a people at all, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, when we, when we speak, we recognize a certain humility. You know, we've been there. We've been in darkness ourselves. And once we had not received mercy, but now we've received mercy. Verse 11, he says this, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world, resident aliens, to abstain from the sensual urges that war against the soul. War against your very being. And he says this, Keep your behavior excellent, among the unsaved Gentiles, which is interesting because, of course, most of these people he was writing were Gentiles, but he says it's the, they make it a point here, the unsaved Gentiles, conduct yourselves honorably with graciousness and integrity, that is, that's what it means, so that by, for whatever reason they may, slan whatever reason they may slander you as evildoers, yet by observing your good deeds they may instead come to glorify God in the day of visitation when he's going to look upon them with mercy. So even though at this point in time we might be in our answers and in our, in our apologia with those who are opponents of the gospel, even though from that standpoint they might slander us as evildoers, as unpolitically correct, or whatever else, yet in the, in the day of visitation, if we have done our job properly, <clears throat> they might instead come to glorify God on that time when he will have mercy on, on them in the future. This is really from that reason that we have to be ready to give an answer. And we do it in such a way that it will not be a stumbling block. The truth is a stumbling block to these people, but we and how we do as we speak and how we relate to them and what we say is not a stumbling block. The truth is enough. Till next week, and we'll talk more about the importance of our words. <laughs>